And good afternoon and welcome to Morris Federation online event. My name is Pauline Woods Wilson. I'm the current president of the Morris Federation. And today we have David Sutcliffe, who's going to talk about his magnificent new book, um, all about the biography of Cecil Sharp. So I'm going to hand over straight to David. Thank you. Thanks very much, Pauline. I uh, hope everyone can hear me. A few hands. Yes, good. Uh, this is the book, new book that's come out last month, um, published by the Ballard Partners. That's Steve Roud and Dave Atkinson, for, to whom gr grateful thanks. Um, uh, it's uh, you can see Cecil Sharp's dates there. Just note that eighteen fifty nine to nineteen twenty four. So um, I'm Dave Sutcliffe, and I've lived uh, near Taunton for the last thirty five years. Uh, I'm now retired after a uh, career in social care. Um, I sing regularly in my local folk club and have been a Morris dancer with Taunton Dean Morris for 30 years. I began writing this biography uh, in September 2020 in the depths of COVID, and it's taken three years to read as much as I can, many relevant documents at um, Vaughan Williams Memorial Library, online service, as it were, in London, getting my hands on as many articles as I could into the different elements of Sharp's life and work. I appreciate that your interest today will be more directed towards folk dance, but I hope you will perhaps bear with me and be pleased to learn a bit more about Sharp in a general way. The only biography of him was written in 1933 by that gentleman, on the right of your screen, Arthur Fox Strangways, a music teacher and a music critic. It was then um, uh, sort of re-edited, uh, the version that perhaps a lot of people have, uh, Maud Copley's re-edited biography, 1967. In fact, Fox Strangways did not meet Sharp until 1904, when Sharp was already 45. And Carpliss didn't meet Sharp until 1909. Uh, she at that time was 24. Their account of Sharp's early life is therefore rather sketchy, just 20 pages, and their approach is certainly deferential. So it's time for a new appraisal. Two books that criticise Sharp's work from a class-based and cultural theory perspective were Dave Harker's fake song, 1985, and Georgina Boy's The Imagined Village, 1993. Their assertions are discussed in the new book. And finally, in, in 2007, the autobiography of Mary Neal was made public. Um, uh, it, this gave her side of the story of the split with Sharp. It was actually written in 1937, 30 years after some of the events described. And it is closely analysed against the correspondence and newspaper reports of the time. Now, I wanted to write a story, not a collection of essays. So it's not, the book isn't in themes, it's, it's, it's the story of his life and it shows the development. I wanted to show his development because he changed his mind about things. Uh, there is obviously a lot of new information since the original biographies, um, lots of new articles. And of course, I trawled endlessly the British newspaper archive. Uh, the book's in five sections, as it were, pre-folk up to 1903, folk songs, folk dances, America, and then his final years. My own experience, uh, of folk enthusiasts is uh, many people are either folk singers who don't dance much or folk dancers who don't know much about uh, about folk songs so if that's a bit harsh i'm sorry um so i have written two separate chapters but in fact sharp was juggling folk song and folk dance after about 1906 onwards uh, so there's a little bit of repetition in those two sections, but I apologise for that. I wanted to make sure everybody knew what was going on. I think I've wanted to stress two new angles that I don't feel were in the original biographies. Sharp as a performer in his own right, 
I think he felt himself part of the chain of transmission and Sharp as an oral historian before the, the word was, the term was invented. He was meticulous uh, more than most other collectors with uh, who gave him his material. So here he is as a performer on the left, playing the pipe and tabor in America in 1915. And on the right there, he's meeting Edwin Clay, actually, near Banbury in 1910, just meeting him in the field with his notebook, uh, probably a tuning fork, but maybe not necessarily, so he could get down some songs. So let's make a start on his life uh, with you. Um, he was the son of a slate merchant, so that's new money, you might say. The housing boom in London uh, generated a lot of business for, for his uh, father's uh, uh, business, and it was the fourth generation, and Sharp was never intended to go into the business himself. Um, his father actually sold up the business. Um, so Sharp grew up in a large middle class family in South London. Um, he went to schools at Western Supermare um, under uh, headmaster uh, Mr. George Heppel. Heppel's wife was a friend of the Sharps, in fact, um, and he set up a school in Western Supermare. And he went on to be vice president of the Na Mathematical Association of this country. He was very good at maths. Uh, and uh, that's probably set sharp on his own um, uh, academic uh, life, as it were. Um, then Sharp went to Uppingham, which is in Rutland, uh, and it was a relatively new um, public school. Very, very keen on music very good music teacher. Everybody was expected to learn or to try music. After that, Sharp went to Cambridge University, Clare College to study maths. And his parents disapproved of music as a career. Uh, so maths it was, uh, but when he graduated, he then took off to Australia. I think his father probably paid the passage and he went off for 10 years in Australia uh, during that time, he could pick up his his uh, his uh, love of music. So that's a significant. Really, that's that's from age twenty three to thirty three. That picture was taken just about turn of the century, I would think. Well, he had to have a day job, sharp, and he worked for five years as legal secretary to this gentleman, Sir Samuel Way, as it happens. Samuel Way was a very keen supporter of music in the city, in the town. Um, Sharp had to come back actually in 1885 because he was seriously ill. Um, it's probably typhoid originally, and then it became an autoimmune dis um, disease, disorder. Um, so not well at all and came back for a year, but he kept his job open and when he went back, he managed to continue as a jobbing musician and joined the Adelaide College of Music as a director in 1889. On returning to London, he was married in 1893 and he struggled to find work as a musician. It has been said that he had social connections and went here and there, it's not true. He struggled, his letters clearly show him struggling to find work. He had no letters after his name and he hadn't studied in Europe music. Uh, so he took a job literally at a new prep school one day a week uh, with other private uh, music lessons where he could. It became two days a week as the prep school um, uh, grew. Uh, then he, in 1896, he, he became director of part-time director of music at the Hampstead Conservatoire. And there he is there with his new family, Constance, Connie, his wife, and his first three children. Joan Sharp became a, a pipe and tabor player, actually. It was the only one really who was interested in uh, folk music, I would say. Uh, Charles in the middle became a chemist um, and went to work at the Rubber Institute in Malaysia. 
uh, and married an Australian girl. And his great grandson is still living in Adelaide. Took me ages to find him. Uh, and he very kindly shared this photograph uh, with me for use in the book. Um, and then on the right, there's Dorothea, the oldest child. He always looks a bit anxious, I think, sharp. He would smile a lot. <laughs> right, the next section is the folk song section. Some of you know, I know, August 1903, Sharp collected the Seeds of Love song from John England at Hambridge Vicarage in South Somerset. He went there to see his friend, the Christian socialist vicar, Reverend Charles Marson. They'd met previously in Adelaide in 1889, so they'd been friends for 14 years. And they worked together for three years, collecting over a thousand folk songs or variants, you might say, in Somerset. Uh, I've just explained that uh, folk songs, well, there's a definition of a folk song. It's an oldish song. Nobody knows who wrote it. A changeable tune, sing it yourself and pass it on. So there's an example there. Sharp and Marston collected 23 different tunes for Barbara Allen. Um, Marson did the words and Sharp did the tunes. There's a little broadside of Barbara Allen. So singers might see it, the song in print or they might just hear it orally and pass it on. Um, so and it, Sharp was very excited, first of all, by the live performance of folk song. Um, he happened to stumble into um, a village with a, a, a lot of singers. And the reason there were a lot of singers in Hambridge is because of the gloving trade. Um, Outworkers would work in their cottages, sewing relentlessly uh, leather gloves. And they would sing, there's no Radio One, so they sang uh, li little songs to each other to pass the time. And um, I can't remember the figure, I think it's eight of those first singers were former glovers. Uh, so uh, Sharp was excited not only by live performance, but also the variety of tunes that he heard. Now, Sharp was working just before recorded sound really was becoming widespread. And it, if you take Barbara Allen, um, Samuel Pepys mentions Barbara Allen in his diaries in the 1660s. So it is an old song. Um, the standard version of it um, it goes like this. In Scarlet Town, where I did, I was born, there was a fair maid dwelling. Kind of everybody knows that's in lots of books. And when Sharp started looking um, in the Hambridge area, he uh, found a gypsy singer called Mrs. Emma Glover uh, in Langport, and she sang this tune. "'Twas in the pleasant month of May, when flowers they were springing, a young man on his sick bed lay for the love of Barbara Allen." It's a lovely tune, and Sharp was excited to get these different tunes. Um, uh, Vaughan Williams was also very excited by the tunes that he found in East Anglia and Sussex. This is the excitement that uh, uh, these collectors felt uh, with these interesting tunes. Quick plug for my website, www.cecilsharpspeople.org.uk. I've done biographical sketches of all these Somerset singers. Um, and uh, just to say, this was his companion, Reverend Marson, born in the same year as Sharp, 1859. And he was a firebrand Christian socialist before the emergence, of course, of the Labour Party. Marson joined the Fabian Society well before Sharp. Sharp joined in 1900. Marson was an early uh, member. Marson was editor of the Christian Socialist newspaper for several years, and he worked among the poor in Whitechapel in London just before Jack the Ripper in the early 1880s. But then he went to Adelaide in 1889, where he founded the South Australian Fabian Society. And he was a working journalist, even after he left London 
they got him out of the way, basically, the church. He was a thorn in their side. <laughs> and uh, he was posted to the rural parish of Hambridge in 1895. So he'd been there for eight years before Cecil Sharp came a-calling. So where did the two men go? Um, the blue figures are singers, not songs, singers in the different parts of Somerset. Uh, there were more train routes in those days and traveling by bike and by train, uh, they could cover um, uh, most of the county. 60% men, 40% women singers, and Sharp came on 20 different field trips over 52 weeks in his school holidays, of course, he was working um, in the education system, as it were. And after Somerset, he went to collect from a further 349 informants. So that's uh, 700 people altogether uh, in his time. Of course, he was one of many song collectors. Um, in total, Sharp collected in England more than 2,900 songs and tunes. And a portion of those, actually, 7% were fiddle tunes from 26 fiddlers because Sharp was also a proficient on the violin. He was in the Cambridge University Orchestra. Just by comparison, I mean, size and everything, Baring Gould collected 708 variants and so on. Vaughan Williams, George Gardner, the Hammond brothers and so on. So um, I think what we could say is different about Sharp was his oral history. His meticulously recorded the singers and published their names in all the Somerset books when they came out, all five volumes. There are fair copies. He made fair copies of all his field notes and they're all digitized at the VWML. And he took 160 photographs of singers with his Kodak camera. Sharp thought he was doing a scientific process. But above all, he wanted people to sing these songs. And that's a little bit different from some people in the Folk Song Society. Lucy Broadwood sort of thought that uh, folk songs should be carefully guarded um, uh, and, and, and left in. Uh, I'll just read you um, Broadwood's quote. The movement for collecting and propagating folk music should proceed quietly, unostentatiously and in the control of experts. And Sharp didn't go with that. He was a performer and he wanted the songs to be sung. Just in case you think Somerset was a, a musical desert at the time, I'll just um, give you some clues. that When Edward VII came to the throne, 1901, things were changing fast. Music was changing fast because this machine on the right there, the wax cylinder that goes uh, turns that way. It gave way eventually, of course, to the gramophone going the other way. Um, the phonograph was expensive. Sharp didn't like them much. They were heavy and he couldn't balance them on the back of his bicycle. But Percy Granger liked the phonograph and used it extensively. So everybody to their own taste. But the, the Edwardians loved their music. Um, in London, there were 78 large plush music halls and 300 smaller ones. So you've got people like Mari Lloyd, you don't dilly dally on the way, um, Albert Chevalier, my old Dutch. Those were musical stars um, in London. And there were musical comedy shows with dancing girls and fabulous costumes. American music, Tin Pan Alley was, uh, uh, and silent movies were also penetrating at the time. Uh, Tin Pan Alley, of course, is in New York, a, a name for uh, 28th Street in New York. Um, and you'd got um, uh, so songs like After the Ball sold five million sheet copies. Um, and then you've also got um, uh, uh, um, copyright issues between the two countries. Songs were flipped across the Atlantic um, and sometimes you didn't quite know where your song was coming from. Um, now, Sharp wasn't attracted to these popular trends and saw the rescue of folk music as a worthy cause. And he was in tune with European 
um, movements, uh, Grieg in Norway, Sibelius, Vorjak, Bartok and Kodai in, in Hungary. But there was a yearning for Englishness. Ray Thorne Williams got cracking in Essex in December 1903. Uh, Gustav Holst is there arranging songs. It was hoped that a renaissance might be taking place. And to do that, to discover Englishness, collectors tended to have more success finding folk melodies in the countryside. And there's a dispute about whether Cecil Sharp deliberately turned his back on industrial folk song or just never came across it or whatever. Though he had blind spots, there's no question about that. Um, but these collectors had their own territories and Sharp chose Somerset because of Marson. And when Sharp went to villages, he found that about a third of the male workforce was still working in agriculture. But actually, the, the um, populations there were very young, demographically under the age of 20. And Sharp found that he got his songs from older people. That's just what he found. The average age of his singers is 62. So there we are, a nice picture with the ubiquitous cider jug there. Um, and there are young men in the photograph. This is near Hambridge. But a lot of young men were drifting into the towns where you could get a wage salary. So I, you be, thank you for bear, bearing with me. But I wanted to explain what sort of a commitment Sharp had to folk song before he even started on folk dance. So from 1903 until 1908, he was working with others, bearing Gould on English folk songs and Alice Gom, children's singing games. The book was written virtually in 1908, was, but was held back um, for copyright reasons to 1909. So that's where um, he was putting a lot of his energy. But gradually he uh, began to pay more attention to folk dance due to his cooperation and then rivalry with Mary Neal. He had first witnessed and noted down dances by the Headington Quarry Morris men in 1899. And in October, about October 1905, he referred Mary Neal to William Kimber on the right. Uh, and he went up to London with his cousin, Richard, to instruct the Esperance Girls Club in the dances. Uh, Sharp gave opening lectures at three of the highlight shows in 1906. So there's good cooperation there. And so I could then turn my attention to folk dance in section three of the book. This is an illustration of the Esperance Girls and Boys the back at Mansion House, 22nd of April, 1907. You'll notice that the artist very carefully captured the traditional um, uh, form, which is one person is out of step with everybody else on the left. <laughs> there we go. Um, and they're dancing, how do you do, sir? Shepherd's hay, trunkles, bean setting, and then the Bidford Morris off. Uh, so basically, Headington dances. I spent hours, I mean days, really trawling through the British newspaper archive to find the Esperance shows. It was hampered a little bit by the fact that there was a, a very well-known yacht at the time called L'Esperance, which took uh, part in cows yachting. And was, I kept having to get rid of all that lot, try to find the Esperance shows and what they were about. And they were nearly all Headington dances. And then there were folk songs from Sharp's Somerset songs. And then there were the children's sing singing games like London Bridge is Broken Down or Fallen Down uh, that had been collected by Alice Gom. In fact, Morris dances were rarely more than 40% of an Esperance programme. There's, there's, I've given you a table there to show you um, the concerts and presentations that I managed to find in the newspapers. And they were recorded in detail. Uh, so 
try to get an idea of what was actually going on at the time. At one point, well, in her autobiography, Neil says that uh, Sharp stopped working with her in 1907. I'm afraid that's not correct. There were two occasions in 1908 where they presented, first of all, a presentation to the Worshipful Company of Musicians on the 20th of May, the Esperance Girls Danced. And there's another program from 1908 showing that um, Cecil Sharp began the afternoon. And then that is a standard um, uh, Esperance program there, Headington Dances, Songs, um, Matty Kay might have sung some, some of the songs, but certainly the Esperance children uh, <coughs> are there with their usual Morris dances. If you want to look at the two, I, I've got to deal with this, that <coughs> Neil was events driven. She worked with young children and her events around the country had a familiar pattern, quick tuition, event, blaze of publicity, and sadly, little or no follow-up. I'm sorry, but I looked through the newspapers very carefully and I could find very little evidence of follow-up after a, an event. Um, I'll give you one example, which um, you might like to hear, is that Flory Warren, who was Neil's best dancer, uh, did gave uh, tuition uh, at the Chelsea College of Physical Education at Southwest Polytechnic, um, you'll see their name coming up in a minute, in October 1907. And if there'd been any follow-up, then Sharp might never have done the cooperation that he did with um, Dorette Wilker, the principal of the Southwest Polytechnic. Things would have been very, very different, but there was no follow-up. Her first body, the Association for the Revival and Practice of Folk Music, uh, in November 1907, had some success, despite its lack of a formal constitution. Mary Neal herself said, we met several times and eventually decided to disband the committee. I called a few friends together and we did start a small association. Her good friend, Emmeline Pethick Lawrence said, this national organization was carried on without a committee and without a special subscription list. And it is the case that there are no minutes of any meetings, no accounts, um, very little from this first association that we can go on. Uh, there is a new book coming out by Catherine Atherton, and I await it with interest in case she has managed to find something that I haven't. Um, but um, uh, my feeling is that, that this was a private body rather than a national organization. And that's why in March 1910, Neil rebooted her organization as the Esperance Guild of Morris Dancers. And this was more precise in its aims. The first association for the revival and practice of folk music is a bit vague. And I don't think Mary Neil knew very much about the Folk Song Society, which of course would have been very, um, might've had its nose out of joint to feel that there was another body dealing with folk music. Neil was much better focusing her attention as that guild. Sharp, on the other hand, was dance driven. Working largely alone, he collected Morris dances and tunes so as to develop his knowledge and begin to lecture around the country. It is clear that he didn't know enough very much about Morris dancing at the beginning of this period. And he was lucky to get that job in February 1909 teaching Morris dances at the PE Training College in Chelsea. Dorette Wilke was a German uh, who came over here and she was a formidable and a very independent um, uh, reform, uh, educational reformer. Uh, and Sharp was lucky to, to, to get a, a job there. He started teaching there as part of the curriculum in September 1909. And he built up a team of young adults rather than children. And that's a really important difference between Neil's constituency, as it were, and Sharp's constituency. Uh, working with young adults, he could build up a team um, and went on to found the English Folk Dance Society in 1911. And Vilka was on the committee. 
Now, Neil say a little bit more about her progress. She was not a musician and she relied on heavily on others like Herbert McIlwain and the, the musical director and Florrie Warren, her best dance instructor. And when they left uh, her organization, Neil rather lost momentum. And although Sharp worked successfully with many women, he and Neil just could not get on my suggestion is that we better reconcile ourselves to this fact. Here is uh, a little bit of a comparison of, or a flow chart, something like that, to indicate what was uh, the two were doing um, during these crucial years. They began together, as we've indicated, October 1905, Neil began brilliantly and um, her organization was very good uh, and setting things going in the right direction for um, a, a widespread revival. They both went to Bidford in June 1906 where Sharp um, recorded tho those dances and then the Esperance girls could use that in their uh, repertoire. Um, Sharp and McElwain produced the Morris book uh, number one, as it were, in April 1907, and talked um, warmly of the co cooperation with Neil and um, her Esperance Club, dedicating the book to that. So then Neil set up that organi her, organi her, her association in November 1907. Sharp began to... Um, Look, look elsewhere and he found the Winster dances in Derbyshire 1908 but um, otherwise he didn't do anything else that year in, in the dance um, way. I, I found this reference in the Daily News to um, in May 1908 as to how Neil was going on after six months of her association and she uh, told the reporter that she had two full-time teachers one part-time teacher and eight evening teachers, presumably based in London. Um, in, in November, unfortunately, McElwain uh, resigned as musical director and that was a bit of a blow. He did so because he could not uh, go along with her political views, which I think means suffragette uh, uh, activities. Um, in the country holiday in uh, about September each year, uh, Neil had invited um, Annie Kenny, uh, who was recently released from prison, one of the WSPU activists. And maybe that maybe that was the last straw for McElwain. It's hard to, to, it is a separate subject really, the WSPU, and Neil was totally committed to it. And its office, WSPU office, Women's Social and Political Union was just around the corner from her and she was on the committee. And, and McElwain was a progressive and he just didn't, uh, he couldn't go along with it anymore. There we go. Um, but um, Neil then struggled a bit. She had some help as a musical director and she received a he very helpful donation of £1,000 from Lady Lytton. And that's equivalent of about £70,000 today. So as a real shot in the arm, she um, had a little bit of exploring herself with the Yardley Gobbian dance and later in the year with uh, Abingdon. Um, and altogether, I managed to find 21 Esperance events during those two years, 1908 to 1909. So she was very busy. Sharp went off on his own, finding those uh, styles of Morris, Chipping Camden, and so on. He ban began experimental classes, uh, Morris classes at that Southwest Poly, as I've mentioned with Dorette Wilker. And he managed to get his women, a women's team together to perform before the King and Queen that summer. So his women's team was formed at that time, uh, two years before a men's team. Um, things were, were going. There was, there was tension between the two, but they were at least not getting in each other's way. Um, and I have a letter here dated 
uh, June 1909, where Neil writes to Sharp, you were good enough to say you would not mind rehearsing the girls occasionally if you have time. So I think it's clear that they were prepared to cooperate. And then unfortunately, the, the Morris book two came out in July, which failed to thank Florrie Warren and the Esperance Club. That was churlish of Sharp, there's no question, and Mary was upset. Sharp went off that summer and found Bleding, Bampton and Bleddington, and in December he did uh, explore Border Morris. He went up to stay with Mrs Ella Leather, who'd already done some research into Border Morris and uh, was about to publish her book, which included some dances. So Cecil Sharp left alone there. And also he had a rather hierarchical understanding of Morris and felt that Border Morris was somehow decadent. Um, pity, because he missed a lot. There we go, another blind spot. Uh, he was very busy. And in December, he produced the Country Dance Book, which actually was not Playford. It was um, country dances that he had collected from various, as it were, living current dance groups. 1910 was really when the wheels fell off their relationship and Mary Neal struck out with her own Morris book and uh, founded the Esperance Guild of Morris Dancers, as I indicated. Um, in, to my mind, she then made a mistake towards the end of the year where she suddenly did a 180 degree turn and attacked Sharp and William Kimber saying that they were inauthentic and that she had found a traditional dancer and that was Joe Trafford, a Headington dancer who had actually not danced for 30 years. So it was a huge bet on this rather elderly man who was a dancer, but not a musician. And I think it was unwise of her to do that. Um, and she didn't really prosecute her case very well because she then disappeared to America for five months. So to my mind, I think Mary Neal lost her initiative at that point, I feel. Um, she had basically a very good team around her. She had Lucy Broadwood, Fuller Maitland, Nellie Chaplin, various people supported her, Kerwin supported her, uh, whereas Sharp was really on his own. Um, but obviously beginning to build, try to build up a team of young adults around him. And then he went to find sword dances. So it's a bit random on Sharp's part. And then, and then Neil disappeared. Um, Sharp carried on in 1911 doing stuff. And at the end of that year, he founded the English Folk Dance Society. As a matter of interest, the only statistics I could find on uh, the Esperance Guild after 18 months was October uh, 1911, where in the, I think it was the Daily News, um, it recorded a, a guild membership of 180. And that was at 10 shillings a go. So 90 pounds possibly, but don't forget she'd had a big donation from a, a couple of years before. Um, Sharp caught the wave better, in my opinion, uh, when he started his organisation. Um, Mary Neal was rather um, dismissive of what she, of what you could call social mechanics, the actual mechanics of running a, a, a an, an association. Sharp was better at it, in my opinion. Um, so we can just see sort of Sharp's, all right, it, it is a couple of years later, but, you know, it, towards the end of this flow chart, 1,324 members, 21 regional branches um, before the First World War. So um, there we are. It, it is a debate and it's, I don't, I don't want, I don't want to reopen scars really. Um, we should be grateful for their contributions, but um, the EFDS has won, DS won the day and Neil closed her, her um, 
organization as soon as war broke out in 1914. I think Neil lost her way a little bit in 1912. She did produce the Esperance Morris book, number two, and then she got involved in this project on the left, which is a cartoon, um, a project running at Earl's Court with, with slideshows, water shoots, rifle ranges, military bands and Morris dancers. And she was committed to it for 16 weeks. Um, I don't really know. I'm sure it was fun, but I, um, if you think perhaps what Sharp was doing during that during that year, all right, all right, a year, he noted six new dance traditions, published three books, regional branches, and oversaw 35 dance demonstrations. So I felt really, um, he outran her really, um, and that um, project was strange. And here is Sharp with his women's team first, and then the men's team was set up later in 1910. On the top right is the composer, George Butterworth. Uh, um, just to say, Sharp's daughter, Joan, is immediately on his left, right as we look at it. And she was quite young there, I should think 15, 16. So there we are, Sharp's publishing his books. Um, and he, he switched eventually um, from a medieval Moorish theory of the Morris to a ceremonial th theory in 1909, holding that the Morris dance was the relic or survival of a primitive seasonal ritual, welcoming the return of spring. He gave no evidence for this and there is none. Um, it's, um, we await <laughs> any evidence. 1910, Sharp went to the north of England, and you can see there uh, sword and rapper's dances. And when I mentioned the country dance books, the first one uh, was living country dance, as it were, and then two and three before World War I were using John Playford's manuals. He went to the British Museum to research those documents from 1651 onwards. And when war broke out, uh, Sharp felt that his he couldn't earn a living anymore. He'd given up his teaching jobs by then, and he felt the pro he, he, he the folk project would not generate any income. And he was offered the chance to go to America by the theatre director Harley Granville Barker, who was quite a radical theatre director, um, to do a, um, a, a production of Midsummer Night's Dream. In that, Sharp had removed the Mendelssohn music and uh, played some folk music with it. And when the fairies dance around in the dream, that was a little country dance. And Grandel Barker liked this um, and paid for his passage over to America. And then Sharp stayed on and found some folk songs here in the Southern Appalachian Mountains. There's Asheville, which was his base. And he moved around uh, North Carolina, Tennessee, Kentucky, Virginia, and so in that sort of circle area there. Um, and he found, to his pleasant surprise, that a lot of the um, singers there had come over from, or their antecedents had come over from, you know, on the Mayflower, as it were, on, on ships uh, coming uh, uh, to America, and they'd taken, of course, their music with them. And so he recognised a lot of their songs, um, where he'd recorded 23 versions of Barbara Allen in Somerset alone. When he went to America, he found 37 versions of Barbary Allen, as they called it. So he was excited by that. He did collect other American music um, and... Um, my spreadsheets show that he did collect other material. And it was very tough um, terrain there. I love that photograph. <laughs> uh, ferry woman, um, it might've been that ferry woman who recommended to Sharp um, that she knew somebody who sang 
uh, and when he went to see, see that person, she sang, black is the color of my true love's hair, which is the first time that that's been, that that was collected, wonderful song. So it's all about coincidences, who you meet on your journeys, lots of walking. Don't forget he was 55 at the time and he was an asthmatic. So he was indeed too old to contribute, but his own son signed up for the, for the, for the First World War and was very badly wounded in France and um, nearly lost his arm, uh, he was badly wounded. So Sharp had um, to find this out when he was in America, letters crossing the Atlantic, um, uh, takes, took eight days for mail to go each way but he found out and kept in touch with his family and sent them back what money he could from his lecture tours. Uh, and, and he taught folk dances over there, mostly country dances, um, for 105 weeks altogether for those four years, traveling thousands of miles. There he is playing the piano there. Maud Karp is there demonstrating something. But he, by chance, had been visited by Olive Dane Campbell, who um, brought him songs that she had uh, collected in the North Carolina area. And he was so excited by these that he did indeed, as it were, drop everything and go down by train, stayed with them and assisted by Maud Carpley's, who noted the words, he collected a, a very good collection uh, 40%, approximately 40% of the titles were American minted stories, uh, song. His reputation in America has been damaged by the use in his diary of an offensive term. You can guess what that is for black people. It's not uncommon, it wasn't uncommon at that time. And you have to read his diaries yourselves, please, to see whether you think it was malicious or not malicious. But his reputation in America is now being uh, very heavily attacked. Um, I think it is important to read his diaries. He was a progressive person, actually. Even at the end of the war, he supported the Labour Party. Um, I do think people should perhaps read the diary carefully first. Uh, when he got back after the war, he had... Um, to revive the English Folk Dance Society. Um, and it was, um, it did grow in size and enthusiasm. The jazz dances from America, like the Charleston had not come in yet till 1925, 26. So either folk or jazz in the twenties, uh, it became. But many young women enjoyed the change in costume and the freedom of expression involved. And most of the members of his Folk Dance Society were women. So if we want to make a general statement about the Edwardian folk revival, we could say that it was strong um, despite the war. Um, and then after, in the twenties, you have the arrival of American movies and jazz. Eventually, of course, after his death, the English Folk Dance Society merged with the English Folk Song Society to become the EFDSS that we know now. Well, I was informed by the Morris Federation and the Morris Ring and Oak Morris that there are currently 100, 812 Morris sides, and that means everybody. That means Clog, Molly, Garland, uh, Northwest, uh, Border, Cotswold, but 812 uh, registered uh, sides, and surely Sharp would have been proud of that. He, he visited 40 locations in person, and found just 15 surviving traditions that he could publish. Basically, he was 50 years too late. If he'd gone in the mid 19th century, he would have found a lot more uh, to record. Of course, if we come through to the second folk revival in the 60s and 70s, got Lonnie Donegan with his skiffle, but then contemporary folk, uh, American, Americans are sometimes more interested in our folk music than we are ourselves. And then electric folk, of course, on the right. And folk music remains very enduring and accessible. 
over 200 folk festivals each year in England alone. I'm not saying that Sharp is responsible for this at all. Uh, folk music is kept going by performers, not necessarily by archivists or collectors, but uh, I'm sure he would be pleased uh, with the scene currently. I suggest really that there are two important but separate questions to ask. Firstly, whom should we most credit for the initial Morris dance enthusiasm? And a separate question was, who's perhaps more qualified to take forward that dance revival? I'm not gonna say, I think you must read the book to see what you think. Um, but I believe they are separate questions. I've said, please read the evidence before you judge by the book. <laughs> I'm very pleased that sales are as good as they are. Uh, it was a lot of work. And I think, although we can't quite know what his personality was, um, I'm sure he was testy sometimes and he wasn't a, a well man quite a lot, but he was a complex individual, a sophisticated person. He wasn't a one dimensional pawn in a political game, which is the impression I always, uh, the least uh, that I could receive from Dave Harker and Georgina Boys. I, I just don't recognize Sharp from their books. He was consistently on the progressive left. The people at the time thought he was on the progressive left. And as I say, he was much more independent minded. He and Marson both quite misfits, really. Um, Marson in the, in the church and Sharp trying to penetrate the music establishment. Um, he fell out with uh, some members of the folk song society over folk songs in schools. He was much more independent minded than currently portrayed. He loved and performed the songs and dances that he collected. And he tried to elevate their status uh, for, the, for national recognition. Some of his theorizing, I think we, we now consider to be inconsistent or plain wrong, but he did his best. Uh, at the time, and it takes, as you know, a long time to build up knowledge and skills in folk music. Uh, don't forget he was doing folk song and folk dance. And if you think of your own journey in folk music, how long it's taken you to build up your skills, um, I think we should be a bit more appreciative of his, uh, his, uh, his folk journey. He probably took on too much and he had blind spots but his energy and drive cannot be denied, and he's left us a considerable legacy. Um, all his field notes are there. You can see him struggling with the tune, scrubbing it out if he couldn't get it right, tuning for, get the tempo right. He was a man at work, trying his best. Uh, but nobody has the last word on Sharp. I certainly don't. There's always new information. But beware of presentism. That's judging people in the past by today's standards and value judgments. I tried hard not to do that. I tried hard to set him in context. Whether I was successful or not, then you only can judge. As I say, he enjoyed dancing himself. He enjoyed what he was doing. Whether he was, a his, you could say he was a historical figure no longer relevant or whether he still has an influence today. I think the fact that people still look up his notes quite a lot indicates that people are keen to use his, um, his legacy. It's the centenary of his death next year in June. And as I say, he had his own folk journey as we have ours. I hope you'll enjoy reading about his journey. Um, if you go to my website and you want to read more and maybe order a signed copy of the book, you can do that through that website. It's also available by the publishers, the Ballad Partners at that website. Some of you I know have already got my book. I'm very grateful. <laughs> so um, I, that's my talk, Pauline. I if you'd oh, like yeah. to unmute yourselves and we'll give, uh, I'll give you a couple of seconds to unmute yourselves and we'll give uh, David a round of applause, please. Well, thank so you for please unmute. Idea, Pauline. 
Oh, Thank pleasure. Thank you very much. Good, so... Well, thank you very much for coming and um well we'll see you next time whenever